Hi and welcome back to the Cat Tutor. Today we will be looking at Grade 11's Chapter 7, Networks and Network Technologies. In this section we will specifically be looking at local area networks, LAN and wireless LAN. Network components, network software, wired versus wireless, data transmission speed, intranet and basic network security. The purpose of a network. A network is a connection of computers and computer devices like phones, tablets, notebooks, etc. through a wired or wireless connection for the purpose of communication and sharing resources. It's nothing complicated. The reason you make a network is to more easily share stuff like especially software, but also hardware and other stuff. No more, no less, it's not really that complicated. Local area networks. This network connects groups of computers and computer devices together across short distances, a building or three max close to each other to share information and resources. Like we said, the network's purpose is to share information and resources like hardware and software. But a LAN specifically, no, it can't span seven, eight blocks, then it becomes a WAN. A LAN has a maximum of three buildings connected to each other and those three buildings have to be like right next to each other. Or it has a minimum of, say, you're in your room busy with your stuff and the next person is in the next room busy with his stuff and you're connected to them and they are connected to the person in the garage and all three of you can game together, that type of thing. That can be classified a LAN. A maximum of three buildings is involved. As with all things, networks, especially LANs, have quite a few advantages as well as disadvantages. Now the advantages would be, once again, you're sharing resources. You're also sharing your connection to the internet if you have one. Software program sharing. Like mentioned earlier, either software or hardware can be shared. Securing of data. It is actually much easier to secure data if it has been centralized. If you can pick one computer and say back up to that computer every day, then it's that, that software is safe. It's, you know, if push comes to shove and there's load shedding or a few of your files go corrupt or one of the hard drives end up blowing, then at least you have backup. So you'll be securing your own data. Communication is easy, fast and time saving. Instead of playing, you know, okay, I've made this move, run to the other room, okay, do this on your computer, okay, now now we're still on the same page, okay, what must I do, R run back and forth. Communication is easy, fast, time-saving. You can sit here, instantly talk to your parent that's in the other side of the house, zero problems. Communi a computer identification. Now, some, most of you, hopefully most of you should know by now that each computer has a IP address. Now this IP address is supposed to be unique for all of the computers in the same LAN. You can't have duplicate IPs in the same LAN. If you do and information is being sent back and forth in this LAN then it will get confused because the IP address is essentially the well address of your computer in the cyber world. It tells the data where to go, what you know, where it came from, that type of thing. So if you can if there's for example two computers with the same IP address, then it might start getting a little eh, frustrating and confusing because your computer will also complain. And sometimes with some networks it even kicks out both the computers that are using the same IP until both IPs have then been changed. So always make sure that there aren't duplicate IPs in the same LAN. Disadvantages, however. 
Data security is a problem. Yes, we just talked about the securing of data as an advantage, but this is in terms of, you know, something, you know, bad luck. But data security in terms of hacking, now nah, that, that starts becoming a problem. Because of the fact that you are now in, in, in a network, it is more likely that you will be hacked or somebody will try and get into this network. If it was just you, your cell phone, your computer, then, yeah, you know, people will just leave you alone. But now you're in a network, which makes it easier to hack you. Because they can hack you through any other computer in the network. So, be careful about that. The other dot security problem is, in networks, viruses spread like a wildfire. No jokes. If one computer gets infected, you better disconnect your computer as quickly as possible and hope that your computer stayed uninfected. You would also have to run your antivirus and check constantly in a network. Is everything clean? Not just your computer, but every single device connected to that network. If you do not check all of the devices in the network, a single device like a cell phone could be carrying a virus that could instantly wipe the entire system in that network so please be very careful always have antiviruses and anti-spyware devices and software in your network at all times at all times keep them updated yes it's frustrating the constant updates of these softwares but please do update them because if you do not update your antiviruses, especially your antiviruses, then unfortunately it won't be able to detect any new viruses. Similar to viruses in real life, viruses mutate. They change their software, they change the coding so that antiviruses can't detect them. It's for this reason that you constantly have to update your antivirus because then they can detect these new viruses and threats. Limitation of distance. As before mentioned, lands can't span across several blocks. There will be too much EMI, or electromagnetic interference. With the sheer amount of technology that we use today, the electromagnetic interference that is basically everywhere, becomes a problem when it comes to long range data transmission. It's for this reason that lands can't be, well, too big because lands most commonly use UTP cables or unshielded twisted pair cables, which will be discussed in more depth later in this video. But the gist of it comes down to the EMI interferes with the signal in these cables. If you also keep in mind that UTP is copper after all. UTP cables have copper insides. The guts of the UTP cables are, well, copper. And electric signals are sent through these copper wires to transmit data. So it also generates interference. After a long amount of time, noise starts interfering with all the signals and data just gets lost. It doesn't get to its destination. This is why UTP also has a limit on how long it can be. Wireless lands, on the other hand, also, once again, it's wireless. There's a lot of interference. The further away you are, the worse the connection is going to get. This is why limitation of distance is a very big problem when it comes to LANs. Server crashes may affect all the computers. If you are centralizing, as mentioned before, all of your data to a single computer, then that computer would serve as a server or as a backup. But if, for example, this computer was also the computer that was providing the internet connection to the whole network, if that computer dies, well, all of your connections die to the internet. 
uh, if that computer was a file server where all of the stuff that you were accessing in the first place was stored on then you won't be able to access it anymore if it was basically any type of server if it crashes then nobody in the entire network would be able to make use of it anymore as you know logic would dictate setting up a LAN is expensive don't let anybody lie to you it is pretty expensive compared to other types of networks it is expensive you do, don't only need to get yourself you know your UTP cables or if you're wireless good for you then you need to get your wireless modems and NICs which once again will be later discussed but the components required for a LAN can become quite expensive eventually this is why it's recommended that you don't try and expand a LAN to several buildings that is the expensive part if you just keep it inside of your house you know your little family connecting to each other connecting to the internet then it's still manageable but if you start trying to expand it even further it becomes too expensive wireless lands versus normal lands local area network just in case you didn't know what LAN stood for wireless LAN is a wireless local area network it's not that difficult advantages there are no cables there are more space easy to connect devices now what is meant by this is with a wired system you'd have to first buy a bunch of devices which will later be discussed you first have to buy those devices and connect all of the cables to that device and then connect that device to the computer the main computer anyway on the other hand with a wireless system you don't have to you can just directly connect the devices however there is the disadvantage that not all things are wirelessly compatible so just be careful of that another advantage would be that it's much more portable than a LAN although a LAN might be much more stable a wireless LAN is much more portable you can move it around easier but the problem is you have to be careful for physical objects a wall believe it or not can interfere with the signal any physical objects in the way between the router and any other device can interfere with the signal so be careful of that the physical the objects and devices around your signal transmitters can be a problem disadvantages it's more expensive to set up in general wireless devices and networks and systems are more expensive to set up than lands added this is relative it depends on how big the system is and how many devices connect to it if you have a ton of devices connecting to the network I really 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 suggest you rather use a wired LAN yes you lose some space but it's much more stable and I mean much 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 more stable think of it this way if you have a wired LAN then it's like giving all of the people in a room a little radio in their ears and you can specifically talk to that person or to that person and or to that person it's like giving everybody a cell phone and texting them everybody already knows who you're talking to well that person at least on the other hand a wireless network take that cell phone away <laughs> the irony being but take that cell phone away now scream across the room to the other person to tell them what to do the amount of noise that sets up and yes this is a term in computer and cyber world as well noise the amount of noise that you make now it starts interfering with other signals now this person has to talk to that person but you have to talk to the other person this person has to talk to that person you know a typical every life scenario everyday life scenario everybody's talking to each other across the network 
but you're also causing a lot of problem because the fact that you're talking to each other across the network you're creating what's known as noise signal interference the more people talk in this network at the same time the more devices connected in other words the slower the network becomes because now you have to sit there what what do you say what it's it's a nuisance and it's a problem in wireless connections this is why I really recommend if you have a bunch of devices that is connecting to each other rather use a wired system it's much more stable give everybody that cell phone tell them each separately okay I can text you that person could text the next person nobody's bothering each other it's fantastic however if you have only a few devices then a wireless system can actually be cheaper than a wired system keep in mind a wired system you have to buy a minimum few components these components are absolutely required whereas with the wireless system most devices already come built in with the function however not all of them so be careful for compatibility issue but most devices most commonly used devices already have wireless systems built into them so you don't have to pay for those extra devices they're only more expensive to set up when you work large scale um, that about covers it yeah there are quite a few more disadvantages and advantages but if every single scenario had to be kept in mind then I'm afraid we would never finish this video <laughs> really I promise you so any valid advantage or disadvantage can be given in question papers and stuff but be careful you have to also provide in certain cases a scenario yes you can say uh, advantage of wireless system is there's no cables but like previously mentioned with the more expensive to set up part in some cases yes in some cases no so yes you can think of your own advantages and disadvantages of the use of wireless and well versus wired lands but be careful to always you know just remember to say why do you say is this an advantage or a disadvantage network components in ICs this is probably the single most important network component added if you have a computer the NIC is the component that translates your computer signals into signals that can be sent via either a cable or a wireless connection now if it's sent through a cable it is either transmitted electrically or through light the light one is very unlikely or if it's wireless it'll be sent through microwaves or radio waves most of the time radio waves only certain devices uses microwaves but your routers modems they use radio waves you know fun fact da, 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 the more you know okay but the cables that you would most commonly be connecting to an NIC are UTP cables unshielded twisted pair cables they have copper inside of them and therefore they are electric signals that are sent components switch modem router what are the, what is the big problem we here nobody knows the difference for some obscure reason a switch connects several computers to the same network as seen in the diagram below there are a bunch of computers connected to a single device that device it's only there to let those computers talk to each other once again you usually only have one NIC in your computer that one network component jack right there that one network port you only have that one maybe for some obscure reason you have two but I highly doubt you'll have more than that which is why yeah if just you and another person are connecting to each other then there's a good chance you can just plug the one end of the cable into your computer the other end into their computer there's a good chance you can do it but let's say you have seven 
now it becomes a problem. How are you going to do that? What you do is you get the device called the switch. The switch is like the bar for all the dunkers. This is where you meet. This is where you share. This is where you send people out on their merry way. This is where all of the messages go through to get to the other computers. So its only purpose is to com connect all of those computers. It does not give you connection to the internet. Not necessarily. The modem, that is what connects you to the internet. It connects either a single computer or an com entire network of computers or computer devices like cell phones to the network. Uh, well, to the internet anyway. It's also known as the cloud, so don't get confused. This is why I also put this in the diagram. The other term that is commonly used to refer to the internet is the cloud. So when they start referring to cloud computing or cloud this or cloud sto storage or oh my goodness, I think I was, then this is generally what's going to be used. So don't get confused if we suddenly start using the word cloud. A modem's use is to connect either a computer or a network to the cloud. A router, this is the two-in-one package. It organizes and routes, hence the word router. It organizes and routes data from a network to the internet like a modem whilst connecting many computers in the network to each other, like a switch. The more you know. By the way, did you know that a modem, or the word modem at least, is an acronym? Yes, believe it or not, if you do, did not know that before, the word modem is actually an acronym. It is for modulate and demodulate. Network components. And so the story continues. Clients. These are the users of the network. This is you. Unless you are an admin in which case. This is not you. Server. The provider of resources and or connection to the internet. Now, if you are a student, which you likely are, and you have a computer class, which you hopefully do, then you will notice that a bunch of computers are at desks and then there's one that only the teacher or lecturer has access to. You're not allowed to touch it. If you do, bad things pal, bad things. But anyway, that one computer tends to be the server. Have you ever had that your teacher loaded something onto the server and poof, suddenly you all had it? Yes, this would indeed be a server. The server is there to provide the rest of the computers, the clients or the workstations with either information or data or well access to printers and other devices or access to the internet. Generally they tend to be file servers though, you know, gives access to software or data. There are five main types of these servers. As I've already mentioned, you get the file server, which shares files, software, and other data in a network. Then you get the proxy server, otherwise known as the internet server. This provides the network with an internet connection. Your ISPs have a boatload of proxy servers, and they share their connection to other people. ISP, internet service provider, you can see how they would need internet servers to provide an internet service. Printer server. Yes, believe it or not, this is an actual thing. Printer servers centralize all printing work in a company and sort it out. By now you should have learned of the printer queue. The printer queue, it's, it's, it's a literal queue. Let's say you print five documents at the same time. You told all of them to print at the same, well, more or less, at the same time. All of these documents will rush into a queue, first come, first serve, and 
then they will sit in this queue and wait to be printed. While in this queue, you can pause their printing, you can completely remove the printing, or you can shift it down in the queue. The printer server is basically one big fat advanced printer queue. No jokes, it is just one bigger version of it. The printer queue is very limited. If it gets overloaded, well, <laughs> so does your RAM, it's not a good idea. But printer server, on the other hand, now you have an entire computer just dedicated to sorting out all of the printing. This is used in large companies and in some, well, hopefully in yours as well, but in some schools. It is also used to centralize all the printing work. Email server. Just, you know, saying email server. Just like the printer server centralizes all the printing, the email server centralizes all the email work. This includes sending the emails, receiving the emails, storing the emails, sorting the emails, all that stuff. You just go to this single one and you say, okay, send it to all these people. Poof. There we go. Not a problem. So, you wouldn't really use this in most places, but in large companies, it does start becoming useful. Because if you have like thousands and thousands of workers and clients and stuff, eh, an email server starts, you know, you see the use in it. It, it really starts becoming useful. Database server. As with the printer and email, once again, it centralizes a large database. However, this database is more often than not, not directly accessible from the server. Usually they, well, for you know, lack of a better way of explaining it, they lock the computer. They don't allow anybody to directly access the server, and I mean anybody. They basically make it one big hard drive, unaccessible directly. You can't just look at a hard drive and know what's on it, after all. So they basically turn the entire computer into one big hard drive with its own CPU, basically. So the database server, then all, let's say an entire company has these massive databases and stuff. They store that database or databases on this single server and then it, you can access it from other computers in the company aside from the server itself. Once again, you're in a class, don't touch the server, you naughty boy. Network software. It refers to all the software involved in arranging and designing the network and operations inside of it. Its general functions are setting up and installing computer networks. It allows network admins to add or remove users, which is very important. It helps admins to protect the network from hacking and other security threats through the use of security tools. And it helps admins allocate storage for data and provide access to that data to the users. Let's say, once again, you go back to your computer scenario, or your computer class scenario anyway. Your teacher would be the admin. They would make sure all of the data is in place and there in the whole nine yards and they would use the system software to provide you with access to it. You can't access everything on the server. Believe it or not, you can't. You can only access what they allow you to access. And it's the network software that makes this difference. It allows you to only access that certain amount. Wired versus wireless connections. The communication medium is one of the most important aspects of a network, as before mentioned. UTP, which can also be called RJ45. The RJ45 is the connection point of UTP cables. Well, the most common one anyway. It makes use of electric signals. The most common and cheapest medium by far. However, the risk of this medium 
is everybody wants to steal it. Keep in mind, it does still have copper inside. And in case you still lived in the innocent world where nobody steals anything, unfortunately, UTP cables are a target for theft because of the fact that they have copper cables inside of them. People would often steal these cables, strip them down for the copper and sell it to scrapyards. Be careful. It might be common and cheap, but it's also a target for theft. UTP cables can't be used over large distances due to signal loss and EMI, electromagnetic interference. EMI is a very big problem when it comes to electric signals. For light signals, it's not that big a problem, which is why fiber is used for long distance instead of UTPs. Electromagnetic interference, electro, electricity, magnetic, self-explanatory, and interference. EM fields causes problems with electric signals. Those EM fields will scramble the signal completely. By the time the signal gets to where it was supposed to be, it doesn't really bear the same message. Think about sending a guy, a messenger, to a king. But now this messenger gets attacked halfway by bandits and then he gets like another third of the way there and then he gets attacked by a bunch of drunkards and then just before he actually reaches the king he trips falls over stairs just because you know there was a rock in the road bad luck for him and then when you finally get gets to the king he completely forgot what he was supposed to say this is essentially what happens with electromagnetic interference all of these things are interfering with the signal and because they interfere with the signal the signal gets well messed up either parts of the message get lost or the entire message gets lost. This is why UTP is only recommended for short distance transmission. Okay, it is however quite stable. Once again, it's a wired connection. Most wired connections are very stable. The only reason why this would become unstable is because of EMI. UTP specifically, unshield the twisted pairs. UTP specifically has a very sweet advantage. They didn't bother shielding them. The reason for this is they made use of cancellation. Once again, keep in mind, if you didn't, for some obscure reason, do this in fourth grade, if you send an electric current through a wire, it generates its own field, especially if this wire is coiled. It generates its own magnetic field and this causes electromagnetic interference so how do you stop a cable from interfering with itself easy you twist them around and you make the one part send in say the one direction and the other part you send it in another direction so then the fields that they generate would be essentially going in exactly the opposite direction then cancelling each other out and this is exactly what they did with UTP cables. They didn't bother shielding them because they knew if they twisted the cables that they'd simply cancel each other out. And this is still used. You can actually see if you've ever had a UTP cable that somewhere opened up or if you have a stripped down one at home, you can go look at it. There are pairs and pairs of cables inside who knows how many sometimes three, sometimes four, but the cable sets are always two and those two are twisted together to cancel each other out. As long as those two cancel each other out, you can pack quite a few of them in, but not too many because there are, there's still that little bit left. So just be careful of that. It's for this reason why you can't have 50 of them together because then yeah, it does start becoming a little hinky and stuff. Fiber, on the other hand, has zero problem. Oh, wait, before I forget, you don't easily detect eavesdropping in UTP. You, it's electric. You don't really pick it up that easy. Somebody can eavesdrop on your network and you wouldn't necessarily know. Fiber, on the other hand, ha -ha, 
because fiber works with light, you will definitely know if somebody's eavesdropping. Think about it this way. If somebody went and they opened up your cable, because for some obscure reason your cable was leading to your neighbor's house, you know, you two were talking to each other, and somebody actually got hold of this cable and opened it up in the middle without cutting any of your wires that do the whole, you know, communication part. But then he made like tiny little holes and connected a bunch of wires to that to those holes, and now, now he can see exactly what's going in your system. You know, hypothetically added. Don't take my word for this. But hypothetically, he, he does this. Now he can hear exactly what you're saying. But now, you take fiber, which uses light, now you cut a hole in it. In order for him to be able to catch that light, he's basically, think about it, you're shining a flashlight from one side. And now somebody wants to see, okay, I want to see what's happening now with that light. You'd have to stick your hand in, but now the other person on the other side is going to know, but listen here, there's a shadow. Suddenly, somebody's eavesdropping. This is exactly the reason why fiber is not that easy to eavesdrop on. It is, however, a lot more expensive. It does make use of a little bit of physics, well, a lot of physics, to mess around with light just enough to send it down a tube. However, be careful. It can't go around sharp corners. Think about it. In school, you were taught light doesn't exactly just bend around a corner. If it did, you'd be able to see your own bum. That's not a good thing. <laughs> it's it's not, not, not something everybody wants to see. It's just, it's just it's not. Spies would have a massive advantage, but mm, just, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just, it's not, just don't do it. It can't go around sharp corners. UTP can. Fiber can't. It's for this reason that fiber is more often used for long distance communication. It's also usually buried because, you know, you don't really want to damage it. <laughs> Once again, it is light. It just, once something goes in front of it, it you know, it's, it just doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Simple as that. So, it tends to be buried safely deep beneath the ground in a nice little safe place. People with earthquakes, I feel so sorry for your network connection. But yeah, it uses light pulses where the electric signals use electric pulses, the light signals use light pulses as the medium. It's for this reason that fiber is probably the single fastest communication medium to date. If there is a faster one, um, out standing, I think, because technically you have discovered time travel. The fastest known, well, yeah, the fastest known speed that anything can travel is the speed of light. And seeing as how light is used in fiber optics, it's, well, the fastest known mode of communication. There's no question really here about that. <laughs> So, it's not necessarily that the data transmission is at the speed of light, though, because it does bounce around a little bit. So, if there's like a second delay, don't panic, really. You do live 70 kilometers away. It's bound to happen. Please, calm yourself. It's, it's not the end of the world. But, yeah, that's the gist of it. It, fiber uses light, it's much, much more easy to detect eavesdropping on it. So, sorry if you wanted to spy on these types of networks, nope, it's not for you. Wireless connections. <sighs> it's the most convenient, but it is quite unstable. Physical objects, as mentioned before actually influence the signal strength. If you put your router or your modem behind your TV, you're not going to have a good connection. It's as simple as that. If you put it next to your computer though, you're going to have an outstanding connection. Unless of course there's, you know, heavy weather. Then, sucks to be you. 
signals can get confused as before mentioned if you and a bunch of other people are standing in a room and each and everybody is trying to talk to each other at the same time you're going to get confused fast when stable once again if you put your modem right next to your computer then you're going to have a pretty fast connection it might even be faster than a UTP connection depending on which network you're using and which type of system they are using. It is very difficult to detect eavesdropping. You can't exactly tell your radio wave where to go. It, you can't even see it. So yeah, it's you easily pick up a few leeches along the way. Guys that, you know, piggyback off of your network. Now the data transmission speed is very important when it comes to picking whether you want a UTP, a fiber or a wireless connection. UTP connections, the most common version of them, the most commonly bought version of them are the category 5E connections. Their data transmission speed is most of the time, not always, most of the time it is one gigabyte per second. Okay, or a thousand megabyte per second fiber now be careful the speed at which the connection or the data transmission speed that speed can actually vary surprisingly enough it does vary they tend to make it vary to avoid any signal loss Keep in mind, UTP over a long distance starts losing its signal because, you know, interference, all that. But fiber, it doesn't lose its signal as quickly, but just to play it safe, they actually change the amount. Fiber up to two kilometers added, up to two kilometers, it will transfer 100 megabytes per second. They can make it a little bit faster, up to one kilometer. They can make it one gigabyte per second. Up to 550 meters, however, nice little short distance, they will make it 10 gigabyte per second. They're not gonna hold it back for that short distance. They're gonna just let it fly. But if it's a little bit of a longer distance, think of it as an athlete. Think of the data being transmitted as an athlete. If you are going to run 500 meters, you're going to want to get it over with. You're just going to go. The 100 meter, phew, you're going to dash it. But the 500 meter, you're going to go. The 1,000 meter, ugh, okay, you want to make it to the other side. So you'll, you'll take it a bit slower. But, you know, you're not also not going to start walking this thing. But the 2 kilometer, oof, you're going to really pace yourself. You're not going to walk. You're not going to walk. Make no mistake, you're not going to walk. You have to run this thing. But you're going to pace yourself. So you're going to just do a light little jog for these 2 kilometers. Similar concept applies to the fiber. They tend to pace it a little bit so that they can avoid any signal loss. Wireless, I really can't give you an estimate. I wish I could. I can't give you an estimate. The reason for this is literally everything has an influence which network you are which system they're using um, what the latest technology is at the point that you are seeing this video um, everything what the weather is uh, how many objects are in your place that you are going to install this wireless every single one of these things will influence the data transmission speed the data transmission speed of wireless also constantly fluctuates it's never really stable with UTP and fiber it is much more stable fiber <laughs> it's just about as stable as it's gonna get but wireless it, it, it's not stable at the all in the least so anybody wants to give a estimate there go for it but it's just not gonna be accurate Intranet. 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 Not the internet, the intranet. The internet is a global network 
made up of smaller networks. There are also intranets. These are smaller private networks of companies. You tend not to be able to just connect to it freely. The public can gain access to only a part of the network, if at all. Like mentioned, you tend to not actually be able to connect to them at all most times. But most companies have intranets. If, if you don't, well, pff, really, do start, you know, thinking. Make an intranet for yourself. It's very useful. The intranet, intranet, that is the private little network of a company. They tend to not give the public access to the whole intranet of theirs, but they tend to give them access to a tiny little part of it, a section of it, you know, usually for commercial purpose, that type of thing. They tend to only give a tiny little part of this intranet. They give that access to the public. That tiny little part is called the extranet. Okay, so in the diagram below, please study that diagram. It is really it makes it all make sense where the internet is the enti the internet is the entire section that the public can access the intranet would be the little piece of that company and the extranet would be where the public can access that intranet there will only be a little part if the public has access to that entire part then it wouldn't really be an intranet it would just be you know a normal network part of the internet the intranet always will have a section that the public can't access that is your more private more, more you know safekeeping special super top secret documents and stuff that's not supposed to leak they, they will keep it in that intranet and they'll only give part partial access to the public, the extra net. Basic network security. It's kind of self-explanatory. There are three basic security measures in a network. Passwords, usernames and access rights. Anybody who's ever had a computer would know of at least two of these three items if not all three passwords they're the most basic form of network security they are literally just a string of characters those characters can be numbers letters special little dots and dashes don't mind yours but most of the time they restrict you to numbers and letters maybe the symbols above the numbers like a at or a hash or a dollar sign or an exclamation mark but that you're not exactly always going to be able to add in a smiley face username usernames are unique identifiers used by users in a network to gain access to information username is your cyber name essentially it's your special name that you use to access your computers or your devices or your special software on the internet saved somewhere secret that you don't want other people to know about. Usernames are also called account names, login IDs, user IDs, any IDs, that type of stuff. And they are most commonly used with passwords. It is rare that they are used without one. Access rights. For those who don't already know this, poor people, for those who don't already know what access rights are there's settings that allow or forbid you from doing certain tasks such as deleting files copying or editing information if you had ha, have ever had a computer then hopefully you would have tried to delete something and a message would have popped up saying no no cease said no not allowed to do that you must have admin rights to do that. No, don't do that. And then you say, no, but I am the admin. Then it's like, oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, this is access rights. Certain users will only be able to do certain things. 
password policies. Guidelines to make a good password. No, do not make your password your cat's name. Please. Anyway, your password. Please make it longer than eight characters. If I, I can probably, you know, just have, make a little program that will try every single combination of three characters that there is. Please, just, just, just make it longer than eight characters. You make a hacker's life much more difficult the longer you make your password. Mix uppercase and lowercase letters. Passwords are always, and I mean always, cap sensitive. If it's a capital A, it has to be a capital A that's typed in. If it's a capital B, it has to be a capital B that's typed in. If it's a lowercase s, it's a lowercase s that has to be typed in. If anybody ever writes a program and they don't make their stuff cap sensitive, their password policy cap sensitive, wow, you make it much easier for somebody to hack into your system. Use symbols and numbers in the password. By using both symbols, numbers, and well, not both, but if you use symbols, numbers, and uppercase letters and lowercase letters, then you do make a hacker's life very difficult because then the only way that they'd be able to hack your system if they don't have access to your password, the only way for them to hack your system would be through brute force measures. And brute force measures take an eternity unless you have like 70 bloody computers working on it at the same time. It will take them forever and a day to try and hack your system. And by that time you would have already caught them. So use a combination of your upcase letters, lowercase letters, symbols and numbers. Don't make it something personal like the name of your cat or your daughter or your crush or your favorite color or what you had for breakfast. Don't. Just, just don't make it something personal. In the same breath, staying at that point, we all know that social media is a fantastic little place that we love blurting out all of our secrets and our life tales. Believe it or not, yes, there are a bunch of these sour people always telling you, but don't do this, don't do and you c kind of ignore them because, ugh, what do they know, <sighs> what do they know? They're the old generation. They don't know anything. Believe it or not, there's actually a reason why you're not supposed to be sharing your personal little secrets on social media. Hackers do not just suddenly pop into your life, go to your computer and try and hack your computer. They follow you. They stalk you. If not in person, they stalk you on social media. You won't know who they are. They'll just look at your stuff. They will get themselves on your friends list without you even noticing if need be. Sometimes they just send you an invite and you accept them because you want friends on Facebook. <laughs> the problem with this is they stalk you. They see. What do you want? What do you like? What's your cat's name? Oh, you have, you have a twin sister which you are inseparable from. They go and then after they have all that, they go and they... The very first thing they do is they go and they go through all of that personal information and they try and hack your system. And more often than not, they actually get in because of it. Because people use personal things as passwords. Don't make your password something personal. Make it something random, but make it something at least you'll remember. Also, Never write your passwords down. Please, man, if you have a sticky note on your computer saying username and password, they're kind of going to know what it's for. Don't make use of patterns like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, or 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. There are algorithms that hackers use that detect these patterns and autofill in the rest. 
it makes their life a lot easier when it comes to hacking your system. So don't make use of these patterns. Change your password. Yes, I know we're all, well, most of us, maybe there's one of or two of you special people out there, the chosen ones that actually follow this. But most people are guilty of this. Change your password every month. I know people tend to forget which password they are currently using if they keep changing it. But it is still a good guideline to follow. By changing your password every month, you reduce the risk of being hacked. Let's say somehow the hacker figured out what your password was and he just got the chance to hack your system. But now the password doesn't work. Why? Because you happen to have changed it in the last month. Okay, so constantly changing the password also helps keeping hackers out. In some industries, it is actually compulsory to change your password a minimum of every six months to make sure that no old grudges can be held against you. That brings us to the end of today's video. I hope that it helped. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and enjoy your week.